very warm welcome from me, everyone, to this Intelligence Squared uh, Plus event. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce our guest tonight, Samuel Moyne. Um, he's a professor of law uh, and history at Yale University. He's written several books about European intellectual history and human rights, uh, including the last utopia, Human Rights in History, and most recently, of course, Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, which, of course, we'll be discussing today. But before that, Sam, very warm welcome to you. Thanks for having me and thanks for moderating. Great. All right. Well, let's begin with the, the basic thesis of the book um, and, and a, a very arresting first uh, kind of uh, excerpt. It, 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 you're right. It's been Americans who are revealing, contrary to literature since Homer, the most elemental face of war is not death. Instead, it is controlled by domination and surveillance with mortality and even violence increasingly edited out. So, Sam, talk to us a bit about that. Well, the, the basic you know view of the book is that warfare has been changing, at least when waged by some states, not all by any means. Um, but yours and mine, the United Kingdom and the United States, have been altering the way they wage war in recent decades and bringing it into conformity with new rules that call for less brutality. Now, it's true, I also foresee you know a kind of chilling future in which they go even further and we just have a kind of bloodless control of the world uh, exercised by these sorts of liberal powers and the basic question of the book is given that brutality is bad is editing out the violence which already seems to be happening you know uh, and could go much further a good thing or is there a dark side to it as well so this kind of new warfare that's emerging, what, what are its kind of essential or most important elements? You can drones, lawyers, um, the detailed territorialization of it, kind of how, how do we think about the, the kind of war that the UK and the US has kind of invented or brought into being um, over the last couple of decades? Well, so I think that after decolonization and after my country's Vietnam War, there was an attempt within the state to heed critics of excessive violence, uh, partly for ethical reasons, but also to immunize you know, warfare against public relations scandals like My Lai at the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, and of course, those never disappeared because war remains brutal. Uh, and there was another such scandal during the War on Terror when uh, Abu Ghraib was revealed uh, in March 2004 and controversy swirled around Gu the Guantanamo Bay site. And yet, uh, it seems as if in response to this kind of new moral environment, the states have been tweaking the way they fight. Um, and that's both with regard to the means they use and the rules they at least follow sometimes. And so the means definitely involved armed drones, which many of us take as like a pit to epitomize this new form of war. But we shouldn't fetishize, you know, that one technique because uh, in the war on terror, there was an increasing shift to special forces, small bands of usually men uh, themselves with high tech weaponry, but visiting uh places to kill um, and that that technique was used massively with increasing frequency across the obama and trump administrations um, now that's the kind of techniques but the rules are are even more central to my account um, because this new moral environment meant that lawyers mattered much more uh, including in very basic uh, uh, activities like picking targets uh, and ruling some targets out. And so the rules changed after Vietnam due to some international events uh, and great powers bought into that updating of rules that requires warfare to be less brutal than in all of history to date, really, and especially the earlier 20th century. And within government, uh, lawyers ascend in, in importance 
because they're the ones who traffic in the rules. They say what's allowed and not. And these lawyers, I argue, tended to ignore rules about whether you can have war in order to press rules about how you can fight it. And so the result, I argue, is that you could even have expanding uses of force across the globe and extending uses of force through time endlessly, even as the the day-to-day -day warfare could become more rule-bound, more conf in conformity with this newly um, new body of law requiring less brutality in the way you fight, even as the fight you know endures without without stopping and, and this is the the kind of counter intuitive kind of i guess kind of suggestion of your book isn't it that that in a, in a, in a way making warfare less horrifying makes it more horrifying because it makes it more endless and and more universally applicable and more palatable to the populations whose whose militaries go out to to wage it absolutely i mean i i'm not sure it I, I want to say, you know, it's it's made more horrifying. It's made differently horrifying, um, be, and and I don't think it should be counterintuitive because I think we all accept that. Um, just to take another example, if we decide that what's most important is to make the administration of the death penalty less brutal, we we may make the actual penalty. Um, you know, le less controversial, more tolerable to more people. And thus, if we want to get rid of it altogether, harder to challenge. Uh, I use the example, which, you know, the United Kingdom was was deeply involved in, and my country too, of the long attempt to, to make chattel slavery more humane, which gave it a new lease on life because a less brutal slavery was more tolerable to at least some important people. And so it stands to reason that we would incur a risk in making war less offensive that we would entrench it. And I'm not, it's very hard to prove that that's actually happening, but it could. I believe it became very important for President Barack Obama to play on the legitimacy that more humane war allowed him to claim for enduring war. And we know that because his two main speeches on the war on terror, on how he proposed to reinvent it, his Nobel Peace Prize address in 2009 and his drones program address in 2013, made the new, new humanity of the war rhetorically central. And of course, he also did introduce new rules that made it central, in fact, to the way that the war on terror evolved after he was elected. How Sam, give us a sense of of, of kind of how widespread this this kind of form of war now is, because because I think kind of beyond the kind of you know the the assassination of certain high profile terrorists or other individuals, or obviously high intensity conflicts, more on that coming later on I, I don't I, we often don't hear about 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 much of this so so how, how 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 widespread across the globe is it is this kind of combination of special forces use and drones and you know and and and, and lawyers well and it, it's a great question an actual conflict probably not very common um, in part that's because there's still you know to the extent there's war happening now there's still you know, extraordinary brutality in it. And that's true whether states like Russia are fighting it or whether there's endemic civil war across the world, which there is, sadly. However, the war on terror was, you know, I think by anyone's estimation, one of the most significant global events in the past 20 years. And it, it was fought by Western powers and coalition, liberal powers with America in the lead. And so, it, it's it's just the kind of bleeding edge, if you like. Maybe that's the wrong metaphor of progress. Uh, and so we we don't know what will happen if China becomes more militaristic than it currently is, or other how how far other states will follow suit and ad adapt to the precedents that have been set in the war on terror. Uh, but I think it's right to raise the concern about the transformation mm. of that war 
because it may cast the die for a future we we want because we want less brutality but we also might not want because we don't want a war torn globe when uh, when lots more states get to practice endless humane war and the the kind of i i guess the the other thread to tease out here is is the way in which more humane wars have caused almost like the abandonment of the ambition for peace so so for humanitarians to actually step away from the idea of preventing conflict and more towards civilizing it is that is that really the kind of underlying kind of concern with 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 this with this uh, kind of new evolution it's it's one of the main concerns um you know, I, I focused on lawyers in government, but of course we know of prestigious reformist movements outside government that have defined our time, I think very deeply, that focus on minimizing or lessening the carnage in war. But they, they are prominent in the absence of any or many organized peace movements. Uh, and they, they, I think, um, you know, stand for a, a time in which people in general have focused their concerns from not having war to, let's say, the lesser ambition of con constraining its brutality. Uh, so if you take those two events I mentioned, Milai and Abu Ghraib, the comparison I think is very revealing on this score. Milai comes at the time uh, in which there's a massive international peace movement. Uh, and this atrocity, when it's revealed, uh, throws fuel on the fire of that anti-war cause and helps bring the conflict to an end. Uh, conversely, Abu Ghraib comes in the absence of any such anti-war pressure, um, though there was more of one in the United Kingdom than in the United States. And the result of the concern about the brutality of the war on terror helped remove, if you like, the bug uh, from the program of what became endless war since the war on terror has not been uh, concluded. And so, you know, th that's just one example, but I try to argue in the book that in, in the very broadest conflict context, we, we used to have very prominent peace movements, in part because war affected people in the transatlantic, notably World Wars One and Two, that led to extraordinary mobilization in order to constrain the use of force. And with the shifting kind of context of global affairs, uh, we're safe and sound from war most part, for the most part. We might even support wars uh, fought by our states elsewhere for the sake of, you know, ethical improvement or humanitarian intervention. Uh, and our, our concern then goes to, you know, not whether our states are fighting, but whether they're fighting morally. And as a result, we've gotten the kinds of kind of ethical attention and, and moral agitation that have been, you know, prominent in our time. Okay, well, Sam, let's, um, let's glance back for a moment to kind of understand where this kind of uh, process began. So World War II, Europe it has just ended, Europe lies in rubble, the, uh, there was a war I don't think we could ever say was sanitized or or, or, or debrutalized in any way. Um, the UN Charter has, has just been created, you know, very much an ambition, of course, to, to really prevent any more state-on-state -state conflict actually happening. What happens next? When does this kind of grand mutation, I think you call it, of, of warfare kind of begin? So I think you're right to start with World War II because it's a war in which what rules there are around the conduct of hostilities um, are not very well obeyed. Um, and that's especially true in aerial bombardment of civilian populations, which with its colonial origins, all, all sides in the war, all powers perpetrate. Um, interestingly, if we look at the Nuremberg trials, the International Military Tribunal, like the UN Charter, the emphasis is on um, constraining aggression keeping great powers in their boxes so that they don't do what Adolf Hitler did. Um, and 
that sets up a kind of baseline for our time in which great powers sort of do whatever they want uh, and we focus much more on how they're doing it now when did the change come well my my argument is that the the really pivotal period was the 1960s and 70s for a few reasons first i think most important was the decolonization of the world the quadrupling of the number of states and the liberation of peoples who'd borne the brunt of the violence of states like yours and mine long before world war ii for centuries and they they want more peace in the world but they also say could you actually fight more humanely and west european powers including the united kingdom no longer have as many reasons to fight since they're giving up their empires and you know not that they don't engage in american coalitions like in the war on terror but they can take a a, a different view of war than they have before and i think you know more more generally people get concerned about civilian death um be, for cultural reasons in the 1960s and 60s 1960s and 70s than they had been before notably because people begin to ponder uh, the Holocaust, which was not given much attention at the end of World War II, but was given a lot of attention retroactively in the 1960s and 70s. But for me, the main cause is in America, where, because that's, that's the great power still fighting most of the wars to this day. And there you get these new humanitarians on the ruins of uh, anti-war movements in decline, and they these new humanitarians focus not on whether war is fought, but whether it's fought in conformity with the new rules that are being crafted in the 1970s, calling for not shooting at civilians, uh, calling for limiting collateral killing of civilians, at least to some extent. And the military uh, also, because of the public relations disaster of my Lai resolves not to stop fighting wars but to fight them less brutally because the public demands it now i never would want to take this too far there's a, a mutation but of course i don't think the results are humane yet they're more humane than the kinds of wars that were fought before, notably World War II. And so this is, this is a really pivotal period. And I think that's why um, the, what we've seen in the War on Terror and its latter parts really is, is kind of you know, anticipated by these events between Vietnam and September 11th, uh, in spite of that brief period under George W. Bush of authorizing torture and setting up Guantanamo Bay and killing lots of people after. This, this mutation, this, this evolution, where was it happening? I mean, are you talking about kind of, um, uh, kind of evolutions in kind of jurisprudential thought? Is it, are these arguments being had in the Pentagon and the corridors of power? You know, does this become a political issue? Is it, is it a kind of a, a, a mosaic of, of, of lots of different things happening? And it, it, what's the concoction, Sam, of, of different interests at work here? You know, is this a kind of cynical ruse to try and make war, you know, less kind of morally draining and damaging for the politicians that, 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 that um, support and mount them? Or is this genuinely well-meaning attempt to try and learn the lessons of Vietnam? You know, I think it's all of the above. Um, and I, I think it's a fantastic question because it forces us to, you know, disaggregate the different kinds of people who might have been involved in it and, and try to fathom their reasons. And I, I concede it gets very complicated. I mean, if you take West Europeans, including, you know, British citizens who have seen their state do pretty terrible, grotesque things for centuries, including at that time recently in, in events like, you know, the, the you know, the, in Malaya in the late 40s or in, in the Kenya and the, uh, you know, Mau Mau emergency and so forth, um, you know, w what's at stake for them to take the moral high ground now? Well, 
partly it's that they're honorable, but partly it's that they're they're being forgetful of what what they've supported or tolerated themselves in living memory. Um, I think that's you know that's all we can hope for for from a lot of people um, that morality has to be compatible with interests and we can't hold out for you know moral choices to be pure. In the case of the U.S. military, I think the warrior's honor was redefined, and these new rules became very important for a lot of people in the U.S. military. But there's no denying that it it was also a response to the public relations disaster. Um, so I don't think if it had just been a few lawyers, there would have been the massive change. I think ultimately we have to get into how culture changed. I mean, if you stopped at the end of World War II or even during the wars of decolonization, a lot of Westerners would not only have tolerated but supported the massive death of non-Christian and non-white peoples they'd ruled for centuries. Uh, and yet after this period of the 60s and 70s, for some people, maybe not you know, everyone, but a, a fair number, um, there can be scandal around what their states do, uh, even in what seem like necessary wars like Vietnam or the War on Terror. And so um, that's enough of a kind of, you know, agent to change the world, as it turns out, because the states people who then run these governments, like Barack Obama, pay heed. And they understand that um, that audience is demanding not an end to war, not an end to great power intervention globally, but a new form of it. And they bring it about. Well, so take take us then, um, kind of through Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so, is it true to say that there, there was reasonably strong consensus at that point in the kind of politico military community, at least, about how that that, that those wars should be fought with far greater restraint of firepower than they were before? And and kind of you know Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, extraordinary rendition. Like, how do they fit in? Were they were they kind of more kind of minor aberrations from from that kind of broader trend i would put it i think i do put it in the book by saying they were the last gasp of the old uh and which ends up allowing for the new to get consolidated at the time in october november 2011 there are there are massive disputes within the u.s government because George W. Bush and certain of his lieutenants do want to lift rules, most obviously in uh, how al-Qaeda is treated and in whether the prohibition of, of harsh interrogation amounting to torture applies. And that happened, and I would be the last to deny it. Um, and of course, the kinds of wars that begin immediately after September 11th um, are almost by nature going to be more brutal than the more recent form of the war on terror. The invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq were heavy footprint involving massive numbers of troops sent, uh, whereas the, the characteristic kind of um, means what we talked about earlier in the second uh, successor form of the war on terror were drones and special forces, which can fight with at least some more precision. Now, even in Afghanistan and Iraq at the height of the violence, I think it's fair to say that the U.S. military and the U.K. military cared a lot more about following applicable rules than those same militaries had in their wars of decolonization or in Vietnam, let alone Korea, World War II, and so forth. So I think um, it's a complex picture, but w w in a way, the, the big public debate that gets unleashed over how the early war on terror is fought um, reveals that the transformation isn't finished, but helps drive that transformation towards humane war along. Okay, well, I think my next question probably has to bring us up to the present, Sam. So, of course, since your book came out, the geostrategic landscape has completely transformed, I think, in ways probably unimaginable, at least to me, 
um, from, from 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 that decade ago. Um, how how's your how do you pass out now? Ukraine, Taiwan, the kind of increasing specter of of really serious kind of mechanized state on state conflict already happening, of course, and 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 possibly more in the future. Um, are, are these going to be wars fought at least on the Western side with a similar level of restraint, or was that something that was almost a, a luxury that Western militaries could in, indulge in? in moments when they had greatly asymmetric advantage over over the opposition that they were pursuing? It's another fantastic question. And and I think my answer has to be, who knows? Um, But let me just foresee two possibilities. One, of course, is that to the extent great powers clash, as in the world wars, uh, there's there's you know more latitude taken by militaries and you know existential threat especially is repelled you know without a lot of concern about the humanity of of the response uh, and so I definitely would wouldn't claim that this new form of warfare is eternal uh, and that there aren't conditions under which it could just you know become a kind of happy memory about how war could become humane before reverting to let's call it its original form however i think that at least for a while and at least uh, even if there's a new cold war with china which you know our countries seem to be initiating um, there will be um, proxy war if the old cold war is any precedent and early forms of potentially direct confrontation in which the rules are taken seriously because they've been entrenched in humanitarian monitoring in military culture in you know political statesmanship as obama's example i think makes so vivid and it's not like those um, are entrenched forever but they're they're real phenomena that i think will have to be eroded um, and so for the moment, I would say this is something we ought to care about. Um, and again, we ought to care about it because this concern um, maybe has led us to care less about whether these wars keep happening, whether we could could angle for better outcomes and not having the conflicts at all, whether brutal or humane. And so, you know, the 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 answer is I, I don't know my sense is again that it'll be all of the above that there will be some instances in which the legacy of of this rise of humane warfare will last a long time but then there will be other instances in which it's it's dropped under pressure do, do, do you think sam that, that there are also um kind of d- pressures from autocratic governments to try at least try and adopt I, I neither of us are military analysts i know but, but at least it seemed to me in the in the early weeks of the ukraine invasion the you know the the attempt of basically to do a thunder run into into kiev was was almost like the russian military trying to do their own version of 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 of, of, of uh shock and awe and and the invasion of iraq you know do, do you read it that way too that that was that was something they were trying to do and they've kind of been forced back into a much bloodier you know, a more indiscriminate form of warfare actually through military inability to to, to emulate um, to emulate uh, what the Americans have done before. I do. So, I mean, I think a few things are simultaneously true. One is that it it's liberal powers, not illiberal ones, that tend to take these rules more seriously. Uh, and so the average war fought by Russians lately, including in, in Chechnya, have been far more brutal, far less, you know, um, concerned about um, humane constraints than uh, the wars initiated by my country or, or participated in by yours. However, what I think is striking uh, is that relative to prior wars, Russians are fighting more humanely too. Now, I don't mean to offer any consolation let alone extenuation in saying so, because what they're doing is illegal in in itself and illegal in its conduct. But there's a last point, uh, which is that, you know, according to the information I've seen, um, 
maybe Vladimir Putin, like Obama, gains some domestic legitimacy from claiming that his wars are less brutal than otherwise they might otherwise have been, at least in the early days of the war, partly for the reasons you know, that they were fighting differently than they are now, as you point out, Russian state media would say things like, we're following the rules, we're fighting humanely. And that's amazing because it's a, an illiberal power and it shows that this, this new moral culture is contagious in a way that you might not have expected. Thanks, Sam. And thank you, everyone, for your questions, which I know are pouring in. And I'll be I'll be turning to those in just a few minutes. But but two two final ones from me, um, Sam. J- just to kind of sort out and 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 stare with a bird's eye view at the at the grand implication, I think of of your argument. In I read your book kind of somewhat as a warning that humane wars have led us to a, a, abandon our desire for peace. Is the is the converse therefore true? I mean, if we would it have been better for us to have kept wars really horrifying and terrible, and therefore have had less of them? Is that is that the kind of implication? <laughs> well, I I want to avoid drawing it, even if others do. Um, partly because it's really hard to make that argument stick. However, I I make one of my heroes in the book, the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, whose character uh, of Prince Andrew in War and Peace actually makes that argument himself, that a war ought to be left brutal so that we have less of it. Now, I, I, I personally wanted to kind of give him some airtime uh, just because it's it it is an unusual view to say the least, you know, for measured by current opinion. But I I also wanted to show how Tolstoy himself himself after kind of experimenting with that view um, evolved, and he he came up in his later years when he was the most famous pacifist in the world with uh, I think a more sophisticated version of the view, and it's to say that. It's not that making war less brutal is a bad thing. It's that it courts certain risks, which includes the perpetuation of war um, or the greater incidence of war. And you know, if that's true, and I think it could be, then it doesn't follow that we should leave war brutal, as Prince Andrew said. It, it follows that we should see if the risk is being incurred in any particular situation and whether we can control or manage it. And more concretely, what it means is that we not abandon peace in the name of the humanity of our wars, as we seem to have done in the past few decades. So I would like to think that we could do both things, control force, including hold Vladimir Putin accountable for starting illegal wars, while also getting really concerned about how they're fought if we have to have the wars. And that seems to me the kind of, you know, more persuasive uh, moral, but there's always this possibility that maybe more brutal wars would be less uh, frequently fought. Uh, and if that's true, we should, you know, at least consider uh, what, what we might say in response. Well, Sam, you read my mind. My last question was going to be about Leo Tolstoy, <laughs> a great hero of mine as well. But, 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 and maybe we'll turn to him in the in the questions, everyone that, that you're going to ask. But, but, last one from me then before handing over. Let's rather than looking to the past, look look to the future instead. Um, future war. There's, 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 I can think of no other human activity that that quite sits at this crossroad of kind of both traditionalism but white hot innovation and and technological advancement as warfare, Sam. So machine learning and 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 you know kind of kind of rapidly advancing avionics and robotics and and all the other things and swarm technologies that, that we now see um kind of finding kind of a p- possible future purchase in 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 war fighting what will that do to the kinds of wars that that at least western countries can electively fight will it become even cleaner even more clinical even even more discriminating, you know, and therefore even easier to do. 
I think to the extent it made it's, it remains asymmetric, you know, which is your earlier point about you know how existential conflict tends to mean taking the gloves off and fighting, mm. uh, you know, with more brutality, not less. I think your prediction is chilling and and scary and apt because uh, in in already it's clear that the armed drone was a primitive tool. It, it evolved across time, becoming more precise, but now we face the prospect of algorithmic war. And that means, uh, you know, using tools, including potentially drones that are unpiloted, uh, not just unmanned, uh, and obey programming. And then everything will depend on what the program is. And I see no reason to think with this new moral culture why the program wouldn't um, demand at least as much humanity, so-called, as the armed drones and special forces that have marked our time achieved, uh, and possibly more. So we can imagine robots that do begin to stop killing uh, and begin to engage uh, with you know new requirements like the one to capture rather than kill or only kill combatants when the risk of no collateral damage has been you know registered by the device and so the these to me are are again you know the the ultimate forms of this development that i'm trying to chronicle in this book because they take you know they make most clear that what's at stake is that in this good thing of editing out not just the killing but possibly even the violence from what we used to think defined it war um could also involves kind of you know forms of control of some peoples over others that we wouldn't accept just as we wouldn't accept having armed drones over our heads sent by some foreign power Indeed. Okay, well, Sam, thank you for that one. Um, let's now move to the audience questions. However long I think we could dwell on uh, on, on algorithmic law, how how, how, how horrifying <laughs> phraseology that is. So uh, Sean from Brighton asks the first one. He, he, he I, 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 Somewhat of a challenge, actually. He says, do you think it's brutality that makes people want to stop war? Um, and he goes on, I think of the plight of Palestinians. West only cares about finding a solution whenever something horrifying happens in Gaza, etc. So you know, how does the media and, and kind of public opinion formation and all of that kind of interplay with, with actually the brutality of the conflict itself, which which mediates, is mediated through all of that? It's a great question and, and challenge, Sean. I mean, I, I want to make very clear that even if you agree with me that the humanization of warfare recently is new and therefore worth studying, it doesn't mean it's a the biggest factor in accounting for why wars happen, and thus for, you know, what 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 would be required uh, to get more peaceful outcomes. I think that is something that would require a different kind of analysis and book. And I I just kind of look narrowly at this this new thing that I think has been neglected in our stories about the recent evolution of war, including. Uh, in the Israel-Palestine conflict, since you know it's only fair to say that Israelis actually pioneered what you could call more humane, more legally framed, and enduring occupation, even before the war on terror dawned and Americans and their allies began to follow suit in seeing that you could sustain a practice um, by saying you're following the rules of how to conduct it uh, and saying you don't torture anymore and saying it's more humane and, you know, it, in various ways. But no, I, I absolutely want to not concede, but just, you know, say forthrightly that if we're interested in peace, a lot of factors have to come together. And it's not as if, you know, we just stopped um, this humane war project, peace would just magically uh, you know, coalesce in, in, in these protracted conflicts, just the opposite. Uh, I do think uh, 
that the kinds of people I was interested in understanding in this book, these this new group of people who think that the humanization of war makes it more tolerable, are much more important in a lot of these protracted conflicts than they had ever been in history. And so it's it's worth getting at what they think and why they think it, uh, but it's someone else's problem to bring peace uh, once we've understood that that topic. Thank you, Sam. The next question touches on an enormously important issue that I have completely neglected, really, to mention any in any uh, previous question, which is about human rights law and the kind of international legal framework. So the, the questioner, anonymous, this one asks, what do you think of human rights law as an international concept? Does it have a future? We've seen the UK as withdrawing from the European Court of Human Rights, etc., etc. Well, where to begin? Because you know, the truth is I've written most of my prior books about human rights and this this one about a different body of law known in the field as international humanitarian law was supposed to be an exit strategy for me. But you're absolutely right that um, in, in the European court's jurisprudence in the al Skaney and other cases, um, which you may have heard about, human rights is being seen as more and more relevant to the conduct of war. Uh, and I do raise in the book this newfangled idea, I think, that it's not just the laws of war that should constrain powers, but human rights law, you know, where, where applicable. Um, and in my judgment, it's, it's, it's an an attempt to, let's say, amplify the ongoing humanization of war or, or intensify it. And, you know, just as a couple of examples of how that might work, people are dissatisfied that the current uh, rules of war don't require you to capture rather than kill combatants, even though they're humans too with r the right to life. Um, and they're especially concerned that the laws of war are too permissive in the number of civilians you're, they allow you to kill collaterally. Uh, and it's been proposed that adding human rights law would make um, uh, it war safer for civilians than the laws of war on their own um, make it. And so this is a noble project, both of them, because soldiers are people and, and, and combatants uh, uh, may have to die in conflict, but civilians die in excessive numbers today. And we, we, we might want to see less brutality on both fronts. But if that's true, then human rights law is, let's say, an accessory of this humanization process I'm trying to analyze. And I have the same answer that I have about, uh, 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 about human rights law that I have about the process in general. Of course, it's a good thing. But is it part of a nefarious project even so that we might want to revisit? Uh, I go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, which says nothing about making war more humane, but it does say it's about bringing a peaceful world about. And I would like to see human rights reclaimed as principles that inform peacemaking, uh, not just the humanization of war making. Another challenge here from James uh, to you, Sam, who says, do you really think Taliban rule of Afghanistan is better than a limited US presence and stability? And I'll, I'll kind of add a slightly wider thought. We probably have neglected to mention the actual reasons why these kinds of more humane wars are being fought and the things they might be delivering in terms of, you know, a diminished Al Qaeda presence or, you know, kind of uh, uh, national security goals or, or whatever. Um, you know, are these wars kind of functionally useful for, for U.S. security? You know, do, do they make the world a, a safer place? Well, it's enormously controversial to say so, but I would conclude no. Um, and that's because th they seem to recreate the problem that they're intended to solve. And so counterterrorism, it seems, has perpetuated terrorism, not contained it. Uh, and, you know, maybe there are other techniques that would do better. I I'd add in the Afghani case that it, it seems as if the alternative to withdrawal would have been eternal presence or even neo-imperial rule. Uh, 
Uh, and yet we know that what accounted for the popularity of the Taliban in, in, in the provinces outside the urban areas of Afghanistan was the drone war uh, and the sense that the Taliban would provide better rulership uh, than the the state in power in in Kabul, and I I don't I sympathize with the question because I'm not claiming that great power withdrawal from the world is you know utopian that then there's no more violence or there not there's not local domination and slaughter. On the contrary, it's obvious that there are both, but. It does seem to me that most of the wars that my country and yours have fought lately, including in this new humane form, have set the world back. And so until we have better ways of creating a less risky globe through our military actions, and especially until we face down the hierarchy that's involved in sending our technology to police other people when we would never submit to the same. I think we should we should draw the conclusion that these wars should be ceased at least you know for a time. Nuclear weapons, Sam, is uh, raised by the next question. Do, do they change your analysis? Uh, they ask. Um, obviously, the most brutal form of war, but um, but uh, basically the end of humanity as well. Well, that's a good case, actually, for Prince Andrew. And if you go right. back to the early Cold War, people in the midst of kind of you know mutually assured destruction said, read War and Peace and said, look, Prince Andrew was right. It's just that it's not brutal war, but the threat of it that will bring peace. And that's how they justified the nuclearization of the Cold War uh, and arms races and so forth. I, you know, I've written this book in the context of a, a generation, you know, our time in which, at least before Ukraine, and I think even during Ukraine, the, the threat of nuclear, any nuclear exchange has seemed remote. Um, I think you, you might reach a different answer about all of these questions when it seems, you know, present. Uh, and maybe it is, and we're just on the brink of 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 you know of nuclear Armageddon, and we ha and we'll, we'll realize at least the few of us who survive that we should have been mobilizing against it. It's worth noting that the kinds of peace movements during the Cold War that were inspired by the nuclear threat have also subsided since 1989, uh, and so they're part of of that picture. Um, uh, I'm trying to construct and, and a peace culture, I think, that I'm calling for would, you know, include a lot more concern for nuclear weapons than we've had. But the kinds of conflicts that we've had lately and that I foresee in the future don't strike me as most likely to be nuclearized. Um, uh, and so my, my focus in the book is on other other kinds of, of war, notably changing forms of counterterrorism. Well, actually, changing forms of, of war and counterterrorism is is the subject of this next question that says, do you think the war on terror is over now with China and Russia being the main threats? And obviously, we can see both our kind of geopolitical, strategic and military communities on both sides of the Atlantic pivoting in an enormous way towards towards um, state based conflict and away from counterinsurgency. Um, I'll, I'll add a, a thought, Sam, which is, you know, perhaps the last couple of decades being dominated by counterinsurgency have led to a certain kinds of weaponry being kind of researched and developed. But perhaps that might be coming to an end as well, might it not? Perhaps the next couple of decades might be seeing much bigger artillery and scarier, you know, forms of kind of aerial bombardment and all those kinds of things. That's, that. I mean, I that's absolutely true. Um, I make a couple, you know, add a couple of provisos because I basically agree with the questioner and with your comments in in the spirit of the question. First, the war on terror is not over, and the legal authority claim to wage it by your state, my, and others has not been relinquished. And I think the clearest evidence of that is in Joseph Biden's speech around the Afghan withdrawal, he made very clear that he reserved the right to strike in and around Afghanistan with 
uh, with lethal force in what he called over the horizon operations. And while it's only fair to note that he's actually curtailed the use of drones, I'm not sure what's gone on with special forces, he's used them, uh, not just in Afghanistan, very famously in, in the killing of Ayman al-Zawahiri, but also in Somalia. Uh, and so my sense is that uh, these states have now a kind of permanent counterterrorist apparatus that uh, is is useful when it's useful, and maybe the threats have subsided, but you, you can imagine uh, lots of interstate war with, with terrorist threats intensifying, and therefore no reason to think that this permanent counter-terrorist apparatus is just being mothballed. Of course, I do agree that the return of more conventional interstate war will have lot, you know, lots and lots of implications. Um, and this kind of asymmetric war will seem, you know, not marginal, but less representative of the kinds of wars being fought. But then note, even there, you see that um, drones are used. You know, the, the, all of us have read the journalism around the Turkish drones and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I think there's no reason to think that, you know, a Chinese Cold War won't have lots of proxy forms in this quote unquote periphery in which um, asymmetric war will be fought. What were most Cold War struggles, but asymmetric counterinsurgencies that were fought in the midst of as part of this larger, you know, superpower conflict. And why would we think the next one wouldn't have similar features? Um, and so if that's true, then I, I guess I, I would say that clearly things will change. They always do. But I, I don't think we're returning anytime soon to a kind of 19th century and early 20th century when big armies clashed uh, with, with, with powers sending them against one another uh, without the kind of, you know, great power intervention that ha has been so dominant in the Cold War and since in, in this evolving form. Thank you for that, Sam. The next question brings us um, to, um, very helpfully, something else we haven't really discussed, which is a kind of domestic political kind of soil, which kind of uh, your message, and I'm sure many others, kind of uh, may or may not take root in. So the question asks, do you think anti-war is becoming a popular political position again in America? Both left and right seem to agree. No, with an asterisk. So, <laughs> you know, one 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 claim I try to make in the book is that ever since the Iraq War, presidents presidents who've succeeded electorally have run against it and 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 war generally. Barack Obama won against a, a more warlike Hillary Clinton in the two thousand eight nominating contest, famously. Um, uh, Donald Trump uh, ran against his fellow Republicans around the Iraq war, was, was thought to have signed his own death warrant in doing so, but actually ascended uh, through that stance and then beat Hillary again, uh, in part, I think, for, for this reason. And then Joe Biden ran against the so-called forever war and his, his you know, decision to hold out against skeptics and complete you know obama's and trump's withdrawal from afghanistan i think shows that there's some pressure from below let's say to contain or even end these wars however there's also pressure from other directions to continue them and we've already mentioned the continuation of counter-terrorist capacities above all i think Putin's move into Ukraine has reactivated the sense that Western powers need to um, be vigilant about what despots do and maybe engage in war against them, you know, which is a, a very familiar stance from the Cold War and after and was, was let's say, challenged because of its consequences the past few years and above all, I think, by Trump and some of the forces he's represented, but that that kind of far right and you know far left view that you know these endless wars need to end, I think um, 
now now seems you know like it's it's kind of been pushed back to the margins where it had been um, for the Cold War and for much of the post 9-11 period um, because Ukraine ha has shown I think to most observers that war is necessary if not direct conflict uh, yet uh, then through proxy assistance and that I think ha means, I think regretfully from my own perspective, that this moment of opportunity in which it was possible for a president to end certain wars, um, even as he was pivoting to a Chinese Cold War, has passed. And I, I'm just not sure what that portends, but it's a great, it's a great question. Well, our time almost has drawn to an end. I think we've got time for, for one final question, um, which, uh, Sarah, is coming from you. Um, one of you sceptical. Can, can you really regulate war? Sarah asks Sam, and if so, how? And, and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps it could have thought, if, if, if you might, on, um, on Ukraine and, and whether the kind of international legal kind of apparatus like, is going to trundle into action there anytime soon, either in the actual prosecution of the war or its very existence? Well, it's it's the ultimate question, and I think Sarah's on firm ground in posing it. Um, I, I would think that, you know, I could ask, can you regulate anything? And if you, you, you think you can regulate some things, you do it through politics uh, and law. You know, you, you, you get a movement together and you make politicians take heed and laws are passed. Now that never means that they're obeyed perfectly. And it's clear to me that while war is incredibly hard to regulate, we have a new legal environment, not just a new moral one, in which some armies fight differently than they did. Now that doesn't mean they're brutal or that we shouldn't treat humane war as as an oxymoron which it still is but they're more humane in their fighting because of new pressure to obey certain rules the harder question i think is whether we can have rules that require great power peace because as you probably know the united nations charter which carl invoked a, a, a while ago requires restraint except for in the case of five countries, including yours and mine and Russia, which never can be branded aggressors in the international system because they have a veto on the United Nations Security Council. So, but I think to the extent that's true, it, it requires better rules since we don't want legal systems that let the powerful off scot-free and only uh, apply to the weak which is what we have now most of the time in law in general, but very graphically when it comes to war and peace. And so I'm not sure, you know, I think the question is very well founded. You know, there's always room for skepticism. And of course, I'm not claiming war is humane yet, just that it's more humane. But I, I, what I can understand is why we would then do nothing. I would assume that we want better regulation, but more attempts, you know, it's like Samuel Beckett, try again, fail better. That's what we need to do with war. Thank you, Sam. Well, on that elemental question, um, we, we must leave it. So Sam, thank you ever so much. Thank you to everyone for all your amazing questions. Um, the book we've been talking about once again is Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. And this has been an Intelligence Squared event, of course, on Endless War. I've been Carmilla. 